in. All right. Welcome, everybody, to tonight's debate. We've got Fight the Flat Earth going up against Bro Sanchez. So thank you guys for tuning in. I'll be moderating. Hopefully, we won't need me at all, and you won't have to hear from me at all. That would be uh, ideal. So we're going to get started. We've got a little different format, but kind of the same as you guys are used to, but there'll be no questions from the audience. So um, there will be a period of time where they'll be asking each other questions uh, to kind of stir some conversation and then answer that. So we'll go from that way. And we're going to start out with each person getting um, a 15-minute intro. And I'm going to flip a coin. Let me go to this website here, coin flip. And who wants to call it? I'm going to go heads. Okay. Calls heads and it is tails. So go ahead and pick what, if you want to go first or you want to go second, I guess there's some strategy involved. Uh, no, that's you, uh, Craig. Oh, um, I'll, I'll go second. I'm quite happy to go second. Okay. Yeah. So we'll start out with uh, Bro Sanchez. I'll put uh, your time on the clock and we will... Um just to clarify is the intro like to introduce ourselves and give our opening argument yeah yeah you can introduce yourself yeah, yeah. You if you want but then cool. mostly it's your your opening argument there right perfect so let me get the clock going and you should be ready to go whenever you want to start okay give me one minute here mm -hmm. hmm. all right so you guys got my screen share here? Mm hmm Okay, yeah. you can you can go ahead and start my my time. Okay. Okay, so I want to start with something called I want to make an argument of motion blur. Right? Let me arrange these slides. My bad. And, and my can you stop my time, Jeremy? Excuse me for everybody. I want to uh hit my yeah, do not disturb. On my phone because I got people texting me and stuff. But okay, so basically, what I want to talk about is space. Space is a place where things can happen there that never we can prove or can happen on Earth. And one of my arguments that I want to introduce in this debate is the ISS, right? For example, the ISS is moving at 18,000 miles per hour. A bullet moves at 2,000 miles per hour. So, but we see astronauts tethered to the ISS and we are told because of relativity, they don't even feel 18,000 miles per hour, which is four times, more than four times the speed of a bullet. And these are some very impressive, uh, uh, you know, numbers these these numbers are just amazing my thing is they have little tools such as drills and boats floating around tethered to them these things should be i mean you shouldn't be able to hold these objects tethered to a, a machine that's going eighteen thousand miles per hour these things should fly out of your hand you know Imagine somebody trying to do mechanic work on a moving airplane on the wing of it. We're told that because there is no space is basically a vacuum. So they're saying that the ISS is moving through nothing, basically through a vacuum. And because of that, there is no drag. But at the same time, they give us comments that appear to be experiencing some sort of drag, which is why they have a dust tail and a gas tail. If you don't understand the argument that I'm making, let me go further. If we're told that the asteroid's atmosphere and, and all of its, uh, you know, compositional makeup, all of these elements are, are just, you know, it's blowing off of the thing as it moves through space, right? It's losing its atmosphere and all of this stuff. But at the same time, the astronaut won't lose his wrench. He won't lose his equipment. The little screw that he's screwing when he's working don't fly out of his hand at 18,000 miles per hour. Right? None of these things happen. And we're just told because of relativity, and that's just as far as it go. I'm going to see how Craig does when he get a chance to respond to that. 
So they say that there's no drag in space, but they then display drag with asteroid tails, comet tails, and all of that. So as this object moves through space, it's losing it, it's some of itself. So we ask the same question with, I, with, with astronauts working on the ISS. So I want him to deal with that one. Um, also, I wanted to deal with this. When astronauts leave the Earth and they look back at the Earth, this is an idea of what they should see if the Earth was rotating at 1,000 miles per hour. They give us the same one-word answer when we ask, why don't we see the Earth rotating at 1,000 miles per hour? And we should see something called motion blur, which I'm going to demonstrate in a minute. We are given the same answer, which is relativity. Hey, Jerry, can you give me a two minute warning, by the way, too, when I'm uh, my two minute when I get to two minutes? Will do. Yeah. So, guys, we should see motion blur. And we are told when we're on the Earth, guys, that we can't feel the thousand miles per hour spin nor see it. They said because the Earth is too big and you're like an ant on a basketball. Right now. They can make that argument from the ground that we can't see the curve if the earth was too big. We couldn't feel the rotation that we was on. And let's let them have that argument from the ground. So let's get off of the earth and go to space. Now, when we leave the earth, one of these are going to be eliminated. The idea that we, were ne we won't be able to feel the spin because we now left the earth. But surely now we should be able to see the spin. If I'm on a merry-go-round, yes, at going around 10 miles per hour, I'm going to definitely feel the spin, but they say that's because that's small. Now, from my perspective on a merry-go-round, I wouldn't necessarily see the merry-go-round's motion blur because I'm a part of the motion myself. But the, the world around me will be blurred the world around me now if you're outside of the merry-go-round looking at the merry-go-round depending on how fast it's spinning you may see motion blur right so here's an example of what i'm saying at a tire just going 80 miles per hour we can see motion blur we can see motion blur on a spinning top that's not going anywhere near rotating at a thousand miles per hour. But when we leave the earth that's rotating a thousand miles per hour, we can't see the motion blur because we're told it's too big is relativity, but we're told that because these are things that they can make these arguments for when we're on the ground, but they can't make these arguments once we leave the earth. And of course, once we leave the earth, we won't be able to feel the spin. So we can't feel the spin if we're on the earth. We can't feel it when we're off the earth, of course. And if we can't visually see the spin when we're on the earth, at least we, can, we, we should be able to see the spin when we leave the earth. I mean, just think about it, guys. They say that we can't see the curve because we're on the earth and it's so big. And we got to get off of it to see the curve. They say we can't see the span for the same reason. So when we leave the earth, we are able to see the curve according to NASA. They give us pictures that show us the curve, they say. But these pictures never show motion blur for an earth that should be moving a thousand miles per hour. And what I have on the screen is what we should see, but we are given objects like this even when we're looking at nasa live streams from space we can't observe visually an earth that's moving that's rotating a thousand miles per hour but we should because that's the way everything else work when we're filming things in motion motion blur and there's no way relativity or anything can get 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 them out of that so he's gonna try but if I can see this from a spinning top, I should be able to see it from a 
globe earth, right? So if I can't see the span or feel the span when I'm on the earth, and I can't see the span or feel the span when I'm off the earth, then how can I prove the span? Because now the span has become undetectable. If I can't see it or feel it on or off the earth, how do I prove it? What experiment can I do to prove that a rotating earth that's rotating at a thousand miles per hour that I can't feel this thousand miles per hour or even visually see it? How can I begin to detect it, which I would need to do in order to prove it right or wrong? It disproves itself by the very fact that it does not exist in any way that I can detect via sight or feel. And, you know, that's important when we're talking about proving emotion. You need those. We're going to see what happens when he attempt these. These are my two main arguments. And I'm also going to talk about in my debate here today how water in space behaves. Because in my opinion, this is one of Craig's weaknesses in a debate. Because I don't think Craig understands that there is no flow in space. Things can't circulate in space. You can't have jet streams and rivers of water in space because the way that gas and water behaves in space is the way this gentleman is showing you here. Things in space don't flow. They glob. So water turns into a super earth or, or you know, spherical globular shape, rather big or small. That's how you get super earths. According to them, if you got gas in space, it's going to glob up the same way, depending on how much you get. It's going to be a gas giant like Saturn or a small, you know, things basically in space, they glob. Whereas things on Earth flow, you have streams, gas rise in a, in a stream, water uh, flows. This is not the case in space. And if this is not the case, don't you know that there's a lot of equipment that they rely on that requires them to. That that requires water to flow. Air to flow. For example, I'm going to show you some of the equipment right here on this collage, which is they use heat pumps on the ISS. You know what else they use? Air compressors. You know what the astronauts on the moon use? Lithium oxide canisters. You know what these canisters needed to have? They needed to be able to circulate uh, gas and liquids through this backpack. They needed to have this airtight from the conditions of space that was around them. And they used duct tape, guys, to make sure it was airtight, by the way. This equipment was relying on air to flow, for liquids to flow. And these things cannot happen in space. He's going to try to come with all kind of mumbo jumbo to make it happen but here's a guy on the iss showing you how water behaves in space he's not the only one i have another uh example here i didn't want to play the video so i did the screen share so these are my main three foundations for today what i'm going to be proposing for craig and i'm hoping that he can you know address them straight on with no dancing and no playing around. All right, so one thing as I summarize all of these arguments, and I want to say, uh, first of all, Jaron, how much time do I got for our open do this? Uh, 2.45. 2.45, okay, cool. I do got time. Okay, I'm going to make another argument, guys, in these two minutes and, and 45 seconds. Flat earthers say that the sun is local, is not 93 million miles away. And if that's true, then flat earthers should be producing crep crepuscular rays to prove it. 
And here it is. If someone think that those rays trace back to a sun that's 93 million miles away, they fail geometry. No doubt about it. We can trace this back to a local sun that's close just the way that flat earthers say that it is. And, and the word local is important. Let's pull up local lighting. Let's pull up an example of local. Because the lighting is local, such as like a street light. That'll be a good example, right? You will see triangulation leading to that, the source of light. So when, when I pull up local lighting, you'll see an, a, a quick example of what I'm saying. The triangulation that we get leading back. See, the, the, the further that I raise this light up, the base will expand. And if you're down on the ground, that will tend to appear like parallel rays of light. And it will light up the entire floor or that side of the uh, earth. In this case, the globe right here, you see the parallel rays because the sun is 93 million miles away. You wouldn't see that kind, no kind of triangulation at all. You see what we have here. But on a flat earth, you would. And guess what? We do observe the triangulation on a flat earth. And you would you would need parallel rays to prove a sun 93 million miles away. And I want to know how he's going to you know, try to combat that when I pair it with the fact that here go pirates, excuse me, sorry, pilots are flying above the sun here. At no point on a globe earth should anyone be able to look down at the sun. This is no eye trick or camera trick. And a lot of globalists don't like to deal with this footage. The pilots are, f are looking down at the sun. This shouldn't be if it was 93 million miles away, you can't look down on an object that's 93 million miles away unless you're 94 million miles away, you know, for example, you know. So the, the clouds is obstructing part of the sun, which letting us know is right where it seems to be. This is no eye trick. We can trust our eyes. We can trust geometry, right? Time. Time's up. Okay, Craig, you got 15 minutes. Um, when you're ready um okay uh do do do, do. Okay, all right i'll just start i'm, I'm ready to go okay uh, good okay so um i'm i'm gonna base my my argument all on the fact that the earth's a globe and we know it's a globe because we've measured it to be so we've not only measured the earth being a globe we've measured the rotation of the globe um we don't need to look at the stars or, or anything for this we can just use surveying methods and basic physics to affirm these things quite easily uh, using the scientific method uh, quite handily also. Um, measurements of the Earth are, are, are quite a good one. There's been measurements of, of Earth's curvature done for centuries. Um, I, I like to point to this one in particular, which is called the transcontinental triangulation of the American arc of the parallel, which was actually measuring Earth's radius by um, measuring across the entire continental United States of America. Uh, the method they use is by measuring triangles um, from different points along the surface of, of the Earth. Um, triangles, if the Earth is flat, obviously, the angles of a triangle add up to 180. Um, the thing is that whenever the triangles are measured with um, the surveying methods that, that they do to, to actually make these measurements, uh, what they find is something called spherical excess. Um, what that means is that rather than the triangles summing up to angles of 180, they actually sum up to more than 180. Um, I probably should have brought the page up in advance, but if I just get down to it so I can show you the data. Um, you, you can find all this quite easily on mctune.net forward slash um, R uh, to actually find all the information yourself and look at it. Um, and these are the tables. They all start showing the um, the directions and the, the peaks that, that they use to make the measurements. Uh, and when you go down and you actually look at the, the measurements overall, what you find is that the, the sum of all the triangles adds up to greater than 180. So like these are the, the they make a grid of triangles across the, the land and then they sum up the angles on these triangles and all the triangles that they used for this um, sur survey summed up to more than 180. 
The only way that that can happen is if it's a spherical triangle, which is a triangle that has angles that add up to more than 180. And the only way a spherical triangle can be measured across the surface of the Earth is if the surface of the Earth is curved. Um, the other interesting thing is that if you take all of these numbers and take all the spherical excess that they've got, um, you actually can calculate the radius of the Earth just from that. And here's all the numbers that you can check yourself. Again, you can find the details if you want to look at it yourself on mctune.net forward slash r. Um, this isn't the only survey like this. The transcendental triangulation of the American arc of the parallel is just one example. Uh, the same kind of measurements um, and surveying you know, missions have been done across all of the world, across the UK, across Europe, across Asia, Russia, um, you know, then again, you can find a lot of these surveys on this website that I just mentioned, uh, and they all show the same thing, that when you do the measurements of the Earth using surveying methods that geodetic surveyors, you know, base their career on, all of the measurements, as it's showing here, find that there's spherical excess. Um, and that's this column here. And it shows that there is a positive number. This column here that I'm pointing at, spherical excess, and they are all positive numbers. The smaller the triangle, the smaller spherical excess. The larger the triangle, like if we look at the one um, Ken IS base, uh, quite a large triangle has a larger spherical excess matching the arc of the curve of the Earth. So measurements of the Earth match what we expect. We don't need to go into space to look at Earth to, to do this. We don't need to, to look at the stars and use shadows. We can use professional surveying methods to measure the shape of the Earth. And when we do it, we find the Earth is a globe. Um, now, the other thing I like to talk about is measurements of the Earth's rotation. And this is quite a, you know, a large thing that's also done um, all of the time. Uh, I've got a degree in physics, as do millions of people around the world. And everyone that does a degree in physics as part of their physics degree actually performs the Foucault's pendulum experiment themselves. Uh, the Foucault's pendulum is um, an example of physics affirming that the Earth is rotating. If the Earth is rotating um, and it's a sphere of the radius that we say, then it will impart certain forces onto objects that are moving on that spherical rotating object. We call these forces Coriolis forces, Coriolis acceleration. Um, and the Foucault's pendulum is an excellent example of that because... Depending on your latitude on Earth, you're going to have a different amount of Coriolis forces applied to the pendulum because the, you know, the Earth's a sphere and different latitudes have different circumferences. So there's different Coriolis forces being applied based on where you are. If you're at the equator, which is 90 degrees perpendicular to the tilt of the Earth, you don't have Coriolis forces. If you're at the poles, you have the most Coriolis forces. Uh, what that means is that you can actually use something as simple as the swing of a pendulum to measure the rotation of Earth, and not only measure the rotation of Earth, just from the swing of the pendulum and the drift that that pendulum gives over a certain amount of time, you can calculate your position on the planet. That wouldn't be possible if the Earth wasn't rotating. There's no reason why this would be a thing if the Earth was stationary. This happens as a result of a rotating Earth, and it matches the predictions and the things that we expect. Um, the argument that a lot of flat Earth has come up with, oh, electromagnetism, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. However, regardless of the material involved, you still get the same results. Um, this person, the, the gentleman physicist, actually used a high-rise building that he's got uh, near him and performed this experiment himself in a very low-tech manner and still managed to get his latitude um, with a margin of error of less than 0.5%. So he had a 1.4 degree latitude uh, error, which is less than you know, 1% of a margin of error of a measurement of his position on Earth matching the predictions. <laughs> This isn't the only way you can measure Earth rotation. There's many, many, many ways, but this is a simple way that shows that physics says that something should happen. We check if that thing happens, and it does. That is science. Make a prediction from a hypothesis, test that hypothesis, look at the results. The results tell us something. So um, 
Okay, the next thing I want to talk about is, is um, uh, Jaron, time check, please. You got seven and a half. Thank you very much. Uh, the next thing I want to talk about is celestial navigation. Celestial navigation is something sailors use and have used for centuries to navigate the seas by the position of the stars. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, not only do uh, does celestial navigation show that the stars' positions change over time, because the nautical almanacs that the sailors use to help them do celestial navigation chart the changing position of these stars. But um, the maths involved with celestial navigation actually include the radius of the Earth um, and, you know, all of the, the process of doing celestial navigation, you know, the dip corrections involved matching the, the, you know, the curve of the Earth. Celestial navigation, the, the entire process is based on the knowledge of Earth being a globe. And it works. It works so well that you can you know, easily find your location on Earth just by looking at the stars and going to that position by using a sextant and a map to calculate your position and direction you need to go. It works. It works. And it works based on maths that involves the Earth being a globe. So if the maths to do celestial navigation involves the Earth being a globe, and celestial navigation works if you do it properly then the conclusion that we can draw from that is that earth is a globe because it works based on the earth being a globe um i i've debated other flat earthers um that have attempted to use the flat earth and the methods of celestial navigation to find a fix the closest the um flat soid got was within 500 kilometers which he said was good and shows that it works no that's that's not good you you can't use the flat earth and celestial navigation methods that are known and taught to to navigate they they're not compatible the methods of celestial navigation and the you know the fact that the changing positions of stars all matches the fact that the earth is a globe it's incompatible with the Earth being flat. Um, okay, next thing is gravity. Gravity is um, is very good because um, I'll just stop sharing for a sec. I don't even think I have been sharing, have I? Bugger, or have I? No, I haven't been sharing. <laughs> I've actually been I've been displaying stuff, and I haven't been. Um, sharing but uh <laughs> never mind um so uh gravity um gravity is something that is, is measured and um gravity shows that uh the, the earth is a globe because um the measurements of gravity match the um the calculation newton's law of fg equals g m1 m2 over r squared now that r squared means that it gives a force that's inversely proportional to the square of the distance between the centers of two masses. Um, and one of the consequences of that is something that we call the potato radius. Um, that means that anything over a certain mass will form a sphere because of um, hydrodynamic equilibrium. With an equal force being applied in all directions from the center, because that's what gravity does it applies a force from the center of something um and an equal one you can do the maths and show that the mass based on the composition will always form a sphere uh, and it and it does we can measure gravity um and show that the predictions of gravity are correct i'm actually going to share the screen this time uh so if we um do, 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 go to gravity measurements so um a lot of people complain that uh, oh you you can't measure gravity um and that's just false M measurements of gravity are done all the time um obviously there's been discussion with things like the cavendish experiment um and a, a lot of flat earthers kind of ignore that because they claim that it's not a real experiment but it is it follows the scientific method but it's also something that can be done on multiple scales and gravity has been measured. This is um, an abstract of a paper that shows that gravity has actually been measured on the sub 100 milligram level. Um, it, it's a version of a Cavendish experiment using two extremely tiny gold balls um, showing that the gravitational force still works at extremely small levels. 
Um, the Cavendish experiment is something that is done by students. Again, every physics student does the Cavendish experiment to measure gravity, showing that mass attracts mass. Now, how do we know that gravity is something that's real? Well, it's used in industries. Um, I want to talk about something called um, uh, do, do, submarines use gravity and they use something called um, gravity anomalies to uh, actually navigate. So the gravity anomaly navigation is a form of navigation that utilizes variations in Earth's gravitational field to determine a vehicle's position. It's particularly useful in situations where other forms of navigation such as GPS uh, and sonar can't be used. Um, so the principles of gravity anomaly, the gravitational field of Earth is not uniform. It, it varies depending on the distribution of mass. So if there is a mountain, there's more mass. If there is no mountain, there's there's less mass. And that creates variations in gravity, that, that concept. And you can use these variations in gravity, especially with underwater mountains, um, to, to map the surface of the Earth and give a gravity map, which is something that has been done. Now, submarines use this knowledge of gravity anomalies to actually navigate in real time. They have a series of accel accelerometers around the submarine that react to the change in distribution of mass to give the submarine a real-time image of the um, surface of the ocean floor below them so that they don't crash into underwater mountains and can still say, stay completely silent. The principles of this are based entirely on the knowledge of gravity being a thing. There's no other explanation as to the acceler accelerometers reacting in the change of distribution of mass other than gravity being a thing. Um, there's many ways to, to, to measure gravity, ma many different ways to show that gravity works. One, one minute, um, it's Craig. not OK. Uh, it's not uh, it's not just in submarines. It, it's in industries um, like mineral exploration and oil exploration. They use gravity anomalies to actually find minerals like oil and, and you know diamonds and everything. And it works. People pay money for this to be a thing. So in conclusion, the fact that we can measure the Earth's radius, we can measure the rotation of the Earth, we can show that gravity is a thing that matches the predictions. And if gravity is a thing, then the Earth has to be a globe. Um, and I'll, I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Thank you much. All right. So we're going to five minute rebuttals. So it's going to start with you, bro. Sanchez, go ahead. You have five minutes to comment on his intro. Okay, so um, let me get my screen share set up here one second. Sure, I'll pause you. All right. Um, Pardon me. I'm going to play um, a little bit of this Eric Dubay video, just a little bit, and I'm going to expound on it in a, in a second. Let's go. In the mid-19th century, a Frenchman named Leon Foucault became famous for swinging pendulums and claiming their consequent motions were proof positive of the Earth's diurnal rotation. Since then, so-called Foucault pendulums have regularly been swinging at museums and exposition halls worldwide, purporting to provide everlasting perpetual proof of the heliocentric spinning ball Earth theory. The truth is, however, unbeknownst to most of the duped public, that Foucault's pendulum was a failed experiment, which proved nothing but how easy it is for pseudoscience to deceive the malleable masses. To begin with, Foucault's pendulums do not uniformly swing in any one direction. Mm. Sometimes they rotate clockwise and sometimes counterclockwise, what? while other times they fail to rotate or they what? rotate far too much. What? Scientists who have repeated variations of the experiment have conceded time and again that, quote, it was difficult to avoid giving the pendulum some slight lateral bias at starting. Did you hear that? Scientists who were involved in the creation of it in its beginning's concept even admitted that they had to actually touch it themselves to get it move. It can never just start moving uh, off the so-called motion of the earth. If the earth is supposed to be affecting the motion of this pendulum, no one should have to touch it. A crane at a work site should be moving the same way. If the earth is a rotating spear, why does it only affect Foucault's pendulums and not no other cranes or anything else that, that that's uh, pit? pendulum based so my thing is they also in most pendulums today Foucault's pendulums they use electricity to run them it's a big scam and a hoax you heard it for yourself do the research the scientists that even created it uh said the same thing I'm saying so let's move on he talked about how the heavens work on the globe there are Giza style pyramids in different continents 
And, and these things still make their alignments with Orion today. The three kings of Orion align over these three pyramids of Giza and others around the real world. And that's been happening for at least 26,000 years, according to science. And guess what? For that to happen, for these alignments to always be perfect and right above the pyramids like what we see here, then the ground that we walking on must be stationary and the sky must be in motion. These people knew that the sky had made a complete revolution once that alignment came back around every time to their, uh, you know, sites. And this is the way we observe the heavens. If I have a Giza site beneath me on this image and I'm aligning it up with a certain constellation that's in my sky at that time, the moment that constellation move over time and time and I see that alignment come back, I know that was a complete revolution. That has happened many times, according to observers, people that go to these sites. This is what these sites make them so special. That wouldn't be possible if we were on a globe Earth because of parallax. The people that built these structures understood that they were on a flat Earth. So let's keep that moving. He brought up the Cavendish experiment. What was the problem with the Cavendish experiment? So the problem with the Cavendish experiment is that Cavendish could couldn't not calculate. Excuse me, Cavendish could calculate the mass of the Earth. He didn't calculate it because he was not interested in that number. Did you did you understand that? Namely, that number in itself could not help geologists to infer about the internal structure of the Earth, which is he's talking about gravity, right? So check this out. If gravity is based, is, if the Cavendish experiment proved gravity, look at this article. Scientists just recently admitted, right? And this was in 2018 that, they don't know how strong the force of gravity is. And when you bring up the Cavendish experiment, the reason those two masses were attracting is because of static electricity and not gravity. Here's an example of what the Cavendish experiment proved, y'all. It didn't prove gravity. It proved static electricity. What's, if gravity is the force that's pulling the water down, what is the force that's pulling the water to the side? That's the static electricity from the pipe. This is just another form of the Cavendish experiment here. This doesn't prove 30 gravity. seconds. This doesn't prove gravity, y'all. And also, just like with Foucault's pendulum, there were many flaws in Cavendish experiment, Cavendish's experiment. So when I get more time, I'll uh, exploit those some more. But it was static electricity proven and not gravity. Thank you. Okay, Craig, you're up for rebuttal. You've got five minutes when you're ready. Um, <clears throat> okay, um, thank you. So uh, the first thing that Bro Sanchez brought up was the speed of the ISS, um, and that tool's not flying out of his hand. There's, there's, well, there's no reason why the tool would fly out out of his hands. The 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 tool has the same momentum of the ISS. It was in the ISS. It had that I, the ISS's momentum. It went outside. It still has the ISS's momentum. That doesn't just disappear randomly. You even, you know, answered the question yourself by explaining that there is no drag in space. However, uh, um, you then went on to try and debunk that by saying, well, there's no drag in space. It explained comets. Well, comets aren't created by drag in space. So um, when the, the you see the tails of comets, the, the tails of comets only exist when the, the comets are within our solar system. Uh, and that's because um, comets are, are made up of ice, mainly, you know, with some rock and other dirt and stuff. And as the comets come into our solar system, or if they're from the outer edge of the solar system moving towards the sun, they, um, you know, the, the solar radiation causes sublimation in, in the ice in the comet. Sublimation is when something goes directly from a, a solid to a gas. And um, that causes, a, a, you know, a corona, an atmosphere around the comet. Um, that doesn't just get dragged away. The the tail that you see is actually because solar rays, charged particles coming from the sun, are hitting 
the you know the the sublimated gases and pushing it away from the comet so that's why there's a tail is because there's a force making that happen not because it's just moving through space so unfortunately it was a misunderstanding of how comets work on your part then he said why don't we see moving blur of earth rotating well there's there's many ways um uh many reasons why um so you're talking about motion blur and that's you know that occurs when the subject of the the camera is moving relative to the camera okay um and scale and distance are very important but one of the most important things is the actual type of cameras that are used um and if you have cameras with um extremely fast shutter speeds so short exposure times what that can do is effectively freeze the image um, and show you a clear image, even if it's looking at something that's moving really fast. So, I mean, and the majority of cameras in space use fast shutter speeds. However, the other point is that it is to do with scale and distance. Now, if I can quickly share my screen. Uh, so um, here we've we've got some bullets being fired uh, and you can see the tracers of the bullets, right? And I want to pause it and, and show you something. So let, let's go back to when the bullets are being fired at the beginning here, and you can see it. So if we if we pause it, what we can see is the bullets closer to the person um, appear blurred. But the bullets that, have, that are further away, they not only appear to be moving slower, but they, they're not as blurred. Because when something's further away from you, the you know the amount of distance that it covers in your vision is going to be less just like if you're standing right next to a plane that's going 500 miles an hour it's going to be a blur but you can look at a plane traveling 500 miles an hour and that plane is not a blur it's all to do with scale and distance so that answers that um uh time 125 okay so uh then you brought up flowing water in space. Yeah, water doesn't just naturally flow um, anywhere. You know, a force is required to make water do things. And you even answered the question yourself by saying that it's in a heat pump, for instance. The answer is they're in pressurized systems with pumps moving the water around. It doesn't just glob up if it's under pressure and being pumped. It just globs up when there's no other forces being applied to it. That is also an example of hydrodynamic equilibrium. Uh, corpuscular rays was the next one. And did you do so? If a corpuscular rays allow us to triangulate the position of the sun, does that mean, for instance, in this picture here, the sun is directly outside of this window or here is it directly outside of this window no i don't think so what about with this is the sun underground oh look it must be underground if we can triangulate the position of the sun from combustion rays no um so the thing about combustion rays is 20 seconds to just do this uh, explanation combustion rays are um to do with again scale and distance and perspective um you can look at a corpuscular ray coming from the clouds and drive past it, and the apparent rays change position based on your position relative to the clouds. It's just perspective. Light breaking through something will spread out. We've measured the distance to the sun right. using radar. Okay. Okay. Excellent. Thank you. Um, now what we're going to do is a one minute back and forth. Well, it'll be uh, Bro Sanchez up first. It's just a QA, and a so it's your chance to ask him a, a question. You can take the full minute to ask it. Then Craig will get a chance to answer for one minute. Then you can respond for one minute. And then Craig can close it out for two minutes. And we'll alternate that back and forth. Roger, Roger. So it is up for um, bro first. And I have the clock set at one minute when you're ready to go. All right. Just a second. So feel free to ask him whatever. All right. What, what I want to. Okay, well, 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 cool. I ain't got time to really go into none of these screen shares. I'll cut the screen share off. It's just a one-minute question. Okay, so for my questions for Craig, um, he said that comets aren't created by drag in space. The tails only exist because the comet is in our solar system. All right. Mm -hmm. The ISS is also in our solar system. So my thing is this. If we are told that things in space that is within our solar, there is no, uh, 
drag in our solar system. I don't see how you got around that, basically, is what I'm asking is, how is the comet being in our solar system relevant to it, the fact that there's no drag in space? Uh, okay, so um, again, the, the reason for the tail on the comet is because it's in our solar system. And the fact that it's in our solar system means that it's subject to the, um, the, the solar radiation coming from the sun, um, which emanates from the sun, charged particles coming out from the sun. And that not only warms the comet causing the sublimation, but pushes those sublimated gases away from the comet. The ISS does not have any solids that sublimate to gas so you're not it's not the same thing um so you know again it's not the dragon space that's causing the comet's tail it's the charged particles coming from the sun sublimation of the gas is being pushed away from the comet a bunch of bs but here's my uh okay here's my next question you talked about them taking pictures of the globe in space from distances such as like the moon and the cameras having these uh great shutter speeds and all that mm -hmm. but yeah. we all you also teach in your model that the way that the sun light comes to earth is we we are able to get those sun rays because we have an atmosphere but as the sun light shine through space we, it is not going to illuminate the darkness of space so we have this point where the sun is what? giving off we have yes we're saying when we're when we ask globalists, why doesn't the sun illuminate the space in between it and the earth? They say, oh, I see, I see. Right. So so how can a camera flash work? Because that light depends on projecting from the camera and capturing everything in the in the uh, light flash. But if light can't project this way in space without an atmosphere. Huh? Yeah, right. Because if the sunlight can't make it to the earth for the same reasons, how did the camera flash make it to the to the earth? I, I don't know what you you mean by camera flash. They they don't use a camera flash to take a picture of the earth. Light travels through space in straight lines and bounces off things like the earth, which then the camera takes a picture of that light, then bouncing from the earth back to the camera. We we don't just we don't see the the light because of the atmosphere. The atmosphere helps scatter the light and make it appear blue when we're looking at the atmosphere from the earth. But you know, light you only see light when it's bounced off something and then that light comes to your eyes. So there's no reason it would light up the darkness of space because there's nothing to bounce off. You see the earth because the light bounces off the earth and comes to your eyes. I, I'm not sure why I have to explain this. You still got a minute and a half to. Uh, um, I, I mean that 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 was his entire question. Really, is 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 um, you know, you I, I, don't, I don't I don't know what you mean mean by um, you know, a camera flash. They don't point the cat. You know, there's not a camera flash on a on a camera on a satellite. That's not how it works. They just <laughs> there's lights coming from the Earth because the sun is making light bouncing off the earth going to the camera and then the sensor of the camera detects that light and converts that into an image that that's how seeing works the same with your eyes um so yeah that that, that answers the question there, there wasn't really anything else to say um okay you can go ahead and start your question for him right uh so that'll be um it. Yeah, so you, you, you said about Cavendish. Uh, oh, sorry, no, um, we, we'll talk about uh, the Foucault's pendulum first. Um, you, you first of all said, oh, well, scientists said that, you know, it, it's difficult to do to not you know, put some kind of lateral bias on it. Yeah, that's why you've got to make sure you do it properly. Um, and that there's no reason in physics it should start itself. The point of the um Foucault's pendulum is that once it's moving, because it's a moving object, it's then subject to Coriolis forces. There's nothing about the Foucault's pendulum experiment that says it should move automatically. That's a, a little bit of a you know a straw man on, on, on your part. Um, so, do, um, what, what do you say about that? What was your question? What well, the, the um, just the fact that you've you've insinuated it should start moving on its own but that's there's nothing in the Foucault's pendulum experiment that says that that should happen so do you realize that you you're you're pushing a straw man 
of what Falkholt's pendulum is by saying, well, it just doesn't start on its own because we don't claim it should start on its own and physics doesn't say it should start on its own. So what's your response to that? Okay, so my response to it is I didn't make the claim. Scientists at that time did. Scientists at that time was making a claim that often you need this pendulum. You got to do, put the motion to it yourself, put a force to it to, to start it. But you didn't say nothing about yes. the hold on, hold on. It's my turn now. You didn't say nothing about the part when I mentioned to you that um these pendulums swing in different directions. They ain't consistent. Some they doing what they want all over the world. They not mm -hmm. really consistent with a globe Earth that is uh you know rotating in one direction. They're all doing their own things. This is a fact. Okay. And I didn't make that up. The scientists that. It, deals with these pendulums this is some of the observations that they've brought up in the history of dealing with the pendulum experiment so that's okay so uh, what, what you showed was actually a video from eric dubay not from a scientist just making claims that it does things it shouldn't there's no scientist that has ever said it does things that it shouldn't science hasn't said that science accepts that it can be a difficult experiment to get right because you know experiments don't have to be simple but there is no evidence that pendulums just start going backwards or or do the wrong thing these are just claims with no evidence behind them that people like eric dubay push um uh, uh, so you know that it's just a, a false assumption that you've heard from eric dubay and kind of repeated um you, you you said about electricity moving them well Yes, some of them have electromagnetic motors to keep them swimming, swinging all day, but that doesn't have to be the case. The one, the example that I, I was talking about and the one I did personally were just, you know, they just swang. And once they stopped swinging, we then measured the amount of drift. Foghorst pendulum experiments don't have to have an electric motor. That's just something that museums put in place to keep it swinging so that the drift can be noticeable over a long period of time. Um, so, yeah, what, what's your problem. response to that? You got two minutes, bro. Okay, so listen. He he didn't show any receipts to show that I'm, you know, lying about or Eric Dubé is lying about the inconsistencies with Foucault's pendulum. And I'll show you why he can't get away with this one, guys. Watch this screen share real quick. If you look at, let's just say a, a typical construction site. If we go to this construction site, with a bunch of cranes on it, for example. And I started to move these cranes in different directions, like the Foucault's pendulum. I'm going to push that one that way. I'm going to push one the other way, push one the other way, because according to Craig, we got to put the motion on it to start it. Okay, I'm going to give it mm -hmm. that. Fine, we'll give it the motion, right? We'll give them all a motion. The question is, if I push each one of these different directions, Will they all sync back up with the motion of the earth, which they should? And that's my answer to Craig, right? Because right now I'm the one supposed to be answering questions. So for my answer to his Foucault's pendulum folly is that we can't react to Foucault's pendulum uh, experiment on our own by using pendulums such as these. All of these would... Uh, swing in their own direction they would never sync up the same direction uh that the earth is rotating and all that and we know that we can do these experiments ourselves that'll never happen and the fact that you saying that they got the electrically power Foucault's pendulum for motion when it should be going off of the motion of the earth rotation is very deceptive because what should be making the pendulum move is the earth rotating like you said not no electricity or generator or and all of that stuff the reason they got to use that is because they have to keep on touching the pendulum to restart it every time it stops so my question right. so we know the earth don't stop rotating so but you're, you're on to uh, your next question starting round two it's on you bro so my next question uh for round you two a, you got a minute go ahead because he didn't deal with this right People for years, these alignments have been taking place, right? You got a Giza uh, in China. You got a Giza in Mexico. You got a Giza in Egypt, people. 
And these ancient people built these structures based on flat earth. They knew that the ground and move people, you know how a sundial works, right? How a sundial works. They know that the ground don't move, but the sky does. This is how a sundial works. This same observation I'm showing you here. What Craig did not do, he did not deal with this. So my question for him is simple. How are these alignments still taking place today, just like they did during the time of the people that was uh, building this stuff, the generations before us and all that, if we're on a globe earth? How is that possible? Um, <clears throat> okay. Uh, how long do I get, sorry, to respond? A minute. Right. Oh, okay. So, um, yeah, measurements of the stars over time shows that the alignment of the stars above the Giza pyramids has actually changed by approximately 12 degrees. You can look up the, um, you know, the, the, the recording of the position of the stars over time. Also, the, uh, the idea that pyramids of Giza are aligned with certain stars comes from the Orion cor correlation theory. Um, which was proposed by Robert Bouvel in nineteen uh, in the 1990s. Um, and it's there's a, there's a lot of controversy around this. Um, it's not even accepted by mainstream academics. Uh, skeptics argue that the correlation is completely coincidental um, and it doesn't even happen every year. And it's just a result of selectively choosing data that supports the theory whilst ignoring other data. Um, you know, the fact that the, the possession of Earth and the measurement of the change in the position of the stars shows that they're not in the exact same alignment that they were kind of debunks that position. The measured change of stars is a thing. You have a minute, bro. OK, so. um, My next question is. I, I presented this. Video. So you've gone quite quiet, bro. I can't hear you. Oh, yeah, thank, you. Th th thank you, guys. My mic was, Lord, thank you. So my next question, I'm going to let you get away with that one, Craig. I can hound you about that one, but I'm not. Um, I'm going to go ahead and move to my next question. You really ran from that one. Now, I played this video to you, and I get, this angle is damning evidence of a sun that should be 93 million miles away. That sun is close and local like us flat earthers say, buddy. You got to explain to me when would there ever be an angle that I can get to on a globe earth in the sky to look down at the sun that's 93 million miles away and through space of separated from me. When would I ever look down at it if the earth is a globe and it's 93 million miles away? When will I ever get this shot? You got two minutes, Craig. Uh, very simple. Let me... Um... Share my screen one sec. Do, 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 do. Sorry, could you stop sharing, please, bro? Thank you. Uh, okay, so um, do, do, do. Earth is a globe. Here's the airplane. Um, and then let, let's say there's like clouds over here. Uh, and then it's simple. You've got rays from the sun, which are coming over here. So from the airplane's point, airplane's point of view, you're going to be looking down on the the rays of that are coming from the sun, um, which will make it appear as though the the sun is is below you. you know, here's the airplane, and there's the clouds. So from the the pilot looking down at the clouds from this position, the sun is going to appear below the position of the plane. Um, we know that pilots do not fly over planes, uh, over the sun. Um, this would be something that would be very, very dangerous. And, you know, radar would be able to detect a sun that was below 30,000 feet that the average airline um, plane flies at. So um, the suggestion that the sun is below the position of planes is ridiculous. That's something that anybody would be able to confirm for themselves seeing the sun below the clouds matches the predictions of the globe um was uh did you do before you, that, that that that's it that that's my i don't need any more time that that explains it mm. just mm -hmm. yeah now we go to uh craig you're asking the question you're uh you got a minute right uh, do, 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 do. okay so um Right, so uh, 
Right. Uh, you haven't responded to anything that I said about um, the measurements of the Earth using geodetic surveying methods that have been done for centuries by hundreds of teams across the world, including the transcontinental triangulation of the American Arc of the Parallel. Like I explained, they use uh, a network of triangles measured across the surface of the Earth. If the Earth was flat, those triangles would all sum to angles of 180. However, um, as I failed to screen share, but I can um, show that to you if you like, the uh, the measured um, angles give something called spherical excess, which means that every triangle measures over 180 degrees. And when you sum up all the spherical excess, you can actually calculate the radius of the Earth. So my question to you, bro, is how is it possible that we can measure the curve of the Earth matching the radius that we are told if the Earth isn't curved? Okay, I'm ready. It's going to be very short and sweet, uh, Jerry. Good. Yeah, we can't. That's the answer. You claim we did, but you didn't prove it. You told me about an experiment, and unfortunately, you failed to screen share to so that we can visually get an understanding of what you were saying. So what I'll Which do- Let me pop it up so, now. So, so, but you know, unless we're gonna give you some more time to explain it when you pop it up, then it- Well, uh, and, yeah, well here, yeah. here's, the, so, here's the spherical excess, that column there, that's all you need. Cool, that's the, cool. the measure it. So, wait for your turn. Yeah. so uh, all of this data is something that needs to be processed and examined. And, that, mm -hmm. and that's, that's something that I will do and that'll be a debate that we'll have to continue. But as of now, I don't have to accept that as fact because you really haven't proven anything other than just said they did it and it proved it. And that's just not how this works. So it just made my job a little easy for that one, honestly. And, and unfortunately for your screen share thing, that's unfortunate. Hey, Craig, yeah, uh, ap ap apologies about the screen share. I clicked the button, but obviously didn't choose the actual screen. Um, that's cool, but you but, can go to yeah. the next. Uh, yeah, so um, it's it's not just me saying things. This is experiments that have been, measurements that have been repeated time and time and time again. You know, um, like I said, there's hundreds of teams that have done these measurements countless times across land masses across the entire world. It's not just me saying something. It's something that has been verified and repeated time and time and time again. Anyone that does these measurements using proper geodetic surveying methods finds that there is a spherical excess. The data is all here. And every time that the measurements are done, the same data is found within a margin of error, because obviously all measurements have margins of error. But it shows that it can be repeated. It has been repeated. And just saying you don't believe it doesn't really debunk the fact that here is measurements that people have done. I'd like you to at least try and answer how this is possible if the earth is flat. First of all, you lied. My words was never, I don't believe it. In fact, I was honest enough to yeah. say that I'm gonna check into it. That's what I said. I said, I'm gonna check into this and process the data and, 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 and examine it. And then I'm gonna have an argument with you on it. But you did not process the data which you should have done for your debate. You simply presented an experiment in a way that requires us to go look it up after the debate. You should have did your work. That's all I'm saying. So thank you for sharing that. You're saying that this experiment proved the shape of the earth. And I just can't say, well, yep, yes, it did. I believe you, Craig. I got to go and examine this experiment, process the data and look more into it. I'm not dumb enough to speak on something that I didn't look into. And you didn't present enough information today to satisfy me enough to uh, make an argument on it. So guess what? It just don't really help you at all today. You you know, this experiment is something I can look into, but I can tell you right now, depending on when they done it, they had limited technology to perform such an experiment of measuring the entire shape of the earth with what you call in transcontinental triangulation this is a bunch of mumbo jumbo but i guess what i can't say that till i look into it but i can tell you right off the bat guys this does not debunks the fact that what the surface of water is always level it doesn't at all and if it does he didn't show us how he didn't show us how but in my 
uh, screen shares, I showed how he's showing a bunch of data for his argument. Well, that data mm -hmm. got to be processed and examined. And I will do that. But guess what? You should have done that for us if you showed up prepared for the debate. So we can move to the next one. You're up next, Bro Sanchez is round three. So go ahead and you can ask a question. You got a minute. So now I can ask uh, Craig a question here for a minute. Okay, yep. so so I want to know, I got a couple of questions uh, in my minute. First of all, when was this experiment that you speak of done? What year? The transcontinental triangulation of the American arc of the parallel was uh, done. I can actually get you the dates. Uh, 1890, um, around then. Um, okay, gotcha, 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 gotcha. thing gotcha. that's been repeated many I, times. I only got a minute, so be brief. Okay, after 1890, when was the next year that it was repeated? It, it's been repeated time and time and time okay, again. Give me, give me the next year. You can't just say that. And unfortunately, I don't have that data available in my head, but there is okay. multiple okay. In, in the okay. website that I have presented, mctune.net okay, gotcha. forward slash R, you can find all the information okay. about multiple I, I, experiments. Okay, so again, again, he did not show up prepared, guys, because he should have showed up with a list of how many times it was repeated versus just showing up making a claim. Got him. Got uh, I do. It's here. Question for him. Do you have any question so, you want to ask? So my question was was for him was that when was okay. the next time that they did this experiment? He can't answer it, so we can move on. Okay, go ahead. You got a minute, Craig? Uh, just, just a minute to respond to that. Yeah. Um. Yep. It, it the I I'm just presenting one that is famous and is known. It's something that's been repeated multiple times. I could you know here is a um if I just quickly screen share to make sure I do it um. Again, it's not my job to process the data for you. I have personally processed data in the, uh, of all these measurements in the past. I just presented you the measurements today. Um, however, here is a large list of the measurements being done across several different places in the world, not just one. It's you know many, many, many times. Um, so you know it's been done multiple times, different positions on the Earth. I can present hundreds of examples if I want to, but it's irrelevant to the fact that it's been done. Me not knowing the exact date when something was done doesn't disprove anything in the slightest or say that it didn't come prepared when here is all the data available. Okay, one minute, Bro Central. Okay, all the data he presented was from the same year, the 1800s in the same time. He, he the one that said that this thing has been repeated many 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 times but he's only showing us one time in the 1800s even on the data sheet he just produced i didn't make the claim so you can't make me make it like i'm doing something wrong here you made the claim that you know that were multiple experiments done but so far you've only showed one i'm just gonna make sure that we know that you only showed one and it ain't my fault that you can't show proof of your claim and you can't make it my fault so uh, if I'm not mistaken, I'm the question here. So let me let me give you a question, real a, another question based on this. I want to explore this some more. Can you or can you not for one final time produce me of any time in the 2000s or 1900s that this experiment was done? You can't give me the date and proof receipts. You got two minutes. No, often... Just, just to say, no, not off the top of my head. Uh, and that's a completely irrelevant point. Um, okay. con containing a uh, large okay. list of data in my head is irrelevant to the point. I have presented the data and it was more than just one. I presented a large list. So please stop saying it's one. It's a large list of uh, measurements that have been done multiple times across the world. Um, and do -do -do, so uh, there's actually been something done in the 1900s. Um, the project undertaken, the leadership of the U.S. Coast Survey measurements taken along the 39th parallel was completed in 1932. Um, there's many, many more that I could point out, but that's just one of the, the, the quick research that I could do. Me not having an entire list of all the measurements ever done is irrelevant to the point that measurements have been done. And frankly, you are running away from the fact that measurements have been done just by going, well, you haven't given me more of them. That's irrelevant and quite a dishonest move on your part. Um, so, uh, 
yeah, I, that, that, that's it really. I, I could present hundreds and hundreds of different um, geodetic surveys around the world. It's something that's been done multiple times throughout the centuries. Um, I know personal geodetic surveyors that have done surveys that I could present that would be in this decade. But, you know, that's irrelevant. I don't have to present things from now when I have lots of data for throughout history. And saying that I should is is just completely ridiculous and not really how debates work in the slightest. It's not my fault that you can't accept the data that has been presented to you and you just want to run away from actually discussing it. Okay, we got the last question of round three. Craig, you're up first. Go ahead. You have a minute to ask whatever you want. Sorry, uh, what's happening now? I, I just another, this is the final one. So you got a question for Bro Sanchez, the final one. You have a minute. Right. Okay. Uh, do, 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 what the things that you talked about? Um, actually, I want to go back to the the, the Falkholz pendulum um, uh, a, when you were talking specifically about the the cranes um, and why don't they do what Falkholz pendulums do? Well, I mean, if the crane was swinging, it would definitely be subject to Coriolis forces. However, there's a lot of wind and stuff. Um, also, you strawman the Falkholz pendulum experiment by saying they should all sync up with the Earth. No, that's not the case. The idea of the Falkholz pendulum experiment is when it's working perfectly, when it is straight and there's no lateral force accidentally applied, you can then measure the Coriolis forces applied to it. Um, so why did you... My question is simple. Why did you strawman the Foucault's pendulum experiment, and then claim that as victory, saying that it doesn't work. Okay. According to him, I strawmanned it, guys. My answer to mm -hmm. him is I just simply made an observation, and um, if the Earth is indeed rotating, why can't the pendulums actually reflect the, the Earth's rotation independently of any outside motion? That's why I made that observation that if I was in this construction site and I was to put all of these pendulums in motion, they would not sync up, right, with the uh, rotation of the earth. He's he's maintaining that they would and that they would also be bound by no, the Coriolis effect. Well, when you say that they would be affected by the Coriolis, that core, that, talking about the core of the earth, we're talking about the Coriolis effect on a globe earth. And if the pendulums are affected by the Coriolis effect, how are they not affected by the Earth's rotation? And, and, my, and my answer to you is mm -hmm. these pendulums should be affected by the Earth rotation. They, they motion should reflect the Earth rotation. And if that's true, they all would sync up to that one motion in this uh, at this site. So I didn't make Adam. a straw man at all. I just made an uh, yeah. observation okay. and asked a question. Great. Yeah. So again, you just strawmanned it once again by making the assumption that they should all sync up. No, that's not what the Coriolis force says should happen. So yes, again, you literally just in your answer there strawmanned what the Foucault's pendulum and the Coriolis force says should happen. There's no reason the rotation of the Earth should make them move on their own. The point of the Foucault's pendulum experiment is once a pendulum is swinging, you can measure the Coriolis force applied to the moving bob of the pendulum. Um, so uh, unless you actually address the Foucault's pendulum experiment properly and stop strawmanning it, you haven't debunked it. All you've done is created your own version of the Foucault's pendulum and what it should be and what you say should happen and try to debunk that, which is the literal definition of strawmanning something. You, you, you can't debunk something by saying it works like this and it should work like this when you're wrong. That is a strawman. You got two minutes to finish it off. To respond to him. Okay, so uh, Craig, here's why it's not a straw man. I agree with you. I said, according to the Foucault's pendulum, there's nothing wrong with them starting it with their own hand and force. OK, I gave you that, even though I disagree with it. I said that, OK, yeah, they have to touch the ball to get it going. It's not you said, no, they shouldn't just set it up and it just start moving according to the earth rotation. They have to a force have to act on it. Then it will reveal this Coriolis uh, force. I gave you that. I said, okay, let's let's do it. I'm I'm not gonna uh, argue with you on do do we initiate this this the uh, motion of it ourselves. 
So therefore, I'm not straw manning it. I'm giving you that. I'm saying if I were to push all of these crane pendulums, I'm, I'm giving you that. So I'm not saying that they should just start moving by themselves and all sync up. I'm saying if I uh, touch them all and make a move, at some point they should all sync up with the rotation of the earth if that's what Foucault's no. pendulum is trying to prove. So I don't see how you still would maintain that I'm straw manning it when I'm giving you the uh, the motion. I'm, I'm saying, OK, yes, they ha uh, oh, let's say they do have to start them themselves. So if we was in this construction site, those uh, cranes would not be moving. And if I say, well, Craig, prove to me that the earth is uh, rotating, you would set them all in motion and you will wait up for us to see a certain pattern on this pendulum to prove the Coriolis force or, or whatever, or the, or the Earth's rotation. And you that's what's being done with Foucault's pendulum, but you're trying to make it like I'm not maintaining that same thing now with these uh, on this construction site, which I am. It's not a straw man. You just can't make this behave like it should to prove your argument. Hey, that's the end of that round. Did you want to do a break? We're halfway through or right on time. It's up to you. Uh, I'm I'm good to keep going. Um, yeah, uh, I'm. I uh, just want to say thank you, journalism. You're doing great as a moderator. I appreciate your uh, your, your your unbiased nature when doing this. Thank you. Yeah, appreciate no that, Jerry. Yeah, we can we can keep going. I'm just gonna okay. cut my camera off for about a minute or two, but we can we can continue it. Thank you, everybody sure. who are uh, uh, in attendance for your support. Yeah, excellent. And now we've got uh, the crossfire section, which is going to be uh, 10 minutes of just kind of open dialogue. But uh, in round one, uh, bro is going to be able to open it up so he can just start the conversation, whatever direction he wants. In 10 minutes, I'll stop us and then we'll reset and Craig will get to kind of introduce a new topic if it gets kind of going crazy. So, bro Sanchez, you can go ahead and start us off with a 10 minute crossfire. Uh, try not to talk over each other. Roger. Okay. Okay. So crossfires. Okay. Back and forth. I got you. I got you. All right, let's get the screen share back popping for this. Yeah, how long is this section for? Sorry, I did not to interrupt. Two, so 10 minutes on this first one, then we'll do 10 minutes with you starting it off after this one. Okay, brilliant. Thank you. Okay, so earlier Craig was showing us some sun rays, and he was showing us the sun rays through a window. And I wanted to uh pull that up and deal with that in my in this uh 10 minutes. So, what happens is this, guys, when the sun rays shine through a window or anything that's a what i think that's called a red herring that don't e that's that's neither here nor there to what we observing the the point is on a globe earth the sun's supposed to illuminate one side of the earth a whole side with parallel rays and that if we go outside and look at the sun rays coming from the sun we should see parallel rays instead of uh, crepuscular rays but we see crepuscular rays if he put you inside of a building and allow the sun the light from outside will actually pour into the uh the building and, and my thing is if depending on what kind of blinds you got you can also change the direction of those rays with the blinds blocking them and alter them no different than a hose pipe skeeting water and the water uh flowing into or, 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 you know, an object or something like that. So the, the thing about uh -huh. him pulling up those sun rays going through the window, those were not directly coming from the sun. That was just the light outside pouring into the window. So, you know, if, if, the, sun, if the light outside is an ocean and the house is in it, then the light can't, it, it's, it's coming in through the window, so to speak. But when we observe the sun directly with our eye as it is in the sky, we should be looking for parallel rays or either uh, crepuscular rays, and we don't need any obstructions in order to make this observation, which is why he shouldn't have had us in a house with the light simply, you know, bleeding in through the uh, window or whatever. Jerry, and I just wanted to let you know the whole time the clock was not going. I don't oh, know. Oh, jeez. So I don't know how I long even I was speaking, but yeah, I'm just trying to be fair i don't want to it's okay uh, we can just keep going it's okay good. cool yeah yeah we just i'm happy to just start at 10 minutes now if that's fine um so my my point with with the windows um bro was that um 
Uh, and you even kind of said this yourself. You know, if you change the shades, it'll change what the apparent you know divergence of the, the, those rays coming through the window is. And that's the thing. The rays are created by the shape of the thing that the, the light is coming from. So right. the clouds, because there's breaks in the clouds, there there's... Um, you know, it, it creates divergent rays. But when you actually change your perspective relative to the position of those corpuscular rays, the apparent position that you could triangulate would be different based on where you're looking at it from. Um, could, could I screen share something a second and, and show you something? Okay. Right. So uh, let me bring this up. Um. So we, we see here um, the shadows, right, that are coming from the sun, okay? Um, and, and it's similar to the corpuscular rays that it looks like it's spread out, right? So would, would, you, would you agree that it's similar that you would be able to use kind of the angles of these shadows to, you know, point towards where the sun is? It, 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 does that match your claim? Uh, I didn't really make such a claim, but I do understand what you're saying here. And I, I, I can, yeah. I, yeah, I'm tracking. Right. So, you know, so, you know, you using your logic, you know, you should be able to take the angles of these shadows and triangulate a relative direction that the sun's coming from. Right. I, I, agree, I agree. However, however, this is my point with corpuscular rays. It's all to do with perspective because this is taken from the camera on a drone. And if we go back to the beginning of the video with the drone hovering directly above, what we find is those shadows, they're not actually spread out. They're parallel. Um, and what this shows is that corpuscular rays are simply a result of your position relative to the, you know, the light breaking through the clouds. You change your position relative to that. The apparent angle of the corpuscular rays will change exactly the same as this. The, from this position, these these rays, these shadows created by the rays of the suns and these posts, they look parallel. But when you get down at a different position, they don't look parallel anymore, even though they, do, they, they still they do. are. They still look parallel to me. Uh, how, how can you say that these look parallel? Look at the one on the left. It's pointing towards the left. And the ones on the right are pointing towards the right. So from your perspective, looking at this right now, you know, those shadows aren't parallel to you, right? Okay. To actually, let me uh, examine the picture myself. We're talking about shadows when we should be talking about sun rays. Let me just point that out, right? We're not looking... Yeah, yeah. For, I, I, I on, mean, they're the on. same thing, hold right? Wait, yeah. wait, 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 wait. In yeah. order to prove a globe with a sun that's 93 million miles away, you need to produce for me parallel sun rays like i produce for you crepuscular sun rays guess what Sim showing me these shadows it mean it, you showing me parallel shadows but i need par i expect parallel shadows that's expected so i don't expect parallel sun rays why would you expect the, parallel on, shadows Be because that's that i i'm not gonna go into see this is what you're doing you want to have a shadow conversation because you cannot have a sun ray conversation with me and win. Well, I, I, I can, but so, this so this is this is the same thing. I got to get so you the back rays from the offer. sun. You're talking about okay, we, shadows. Huh. I'm talking about sun rays. Okay, I don't can we agree that how the two relate? Could, okay, bro, can we can we agree that sun rays create the shadows? The sun rays are hitting those posts, creating those shadows. So if the sun rays are parallel. The shadows will also be parallel. No, 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 no. That is not how it works. What do you mean? No, work. that is not how. What do you mean? Works. How is it not? That's exactly okay. how it works. But you, you, okay. Let me explain to you why that isn't how it works. The sun rays, the sunlight is what's creating those shadows. We both agree with that. But what we don't, yeah. what we don't agree with though, is whether the sun rays are crepuscular or parallel you're showing me parallel shadows and you saying that uh -huh. because the shadows are parallel the sun rays are parallel and i don't know that that's crazy logic. yeah that, that's exactly no, you no, can't no, have no. parallel shadows without parallel sun rays creating those shadows if the rays of the light were coming from corpuscular so, rays like so, you say so, wait, 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 wait uh, please let me finish right if like you say the rays of light are coming spread out which is what we see with the corpuscular rays okay then those spread out rays will cause those shadows to be spread out when you're looking at it from above. They will not be parallel like I showed. 
But what you see is that even when they look spread out, the same as crepuscular rays look spread out, when viewed from a different position, a different perspective, it shows that they're not spread out, they're, they're actually parallel, and it's actually, in this case, a trick of perspective, which is why when you watch a, um, a time-lapse of crepuscular rays, hold on, hold on, hold you can on, hold see on, that the apparent on. position changes, right? Wait, wait a minute, wait a minute. Here's why what you're saying makes no sense. The whole point of us talking about sun rays was trying to answer the question on how far away is the sun. And you're telling yeah, me, we can get right, to that. okay, yeah. you're telling me that the sun is 93 million miles away and, and uh, that yeah. it is indeed making parallel sun rays. But you never really answered to the observations that we show. You went to some shadows and all that stuff. You never really answered to the fact that you never really explained the crepuscular rays that we observe in nature. I, you, I you did. Just, and then you, you, you never really did that. If your explanation was the I, shadows. I, I, I did. If your explanation was the shadows, then I'm just going to say that no. that is not. A <clears throat> no, the, the shadows were an example of what would happen if the rays were parallel or spread out. Um, I explained the crepuscular rays exactly saying that the same as the shadows, the apparent divergence of the crepuscular rays is simply a trick of perspective. I did respond to that. I did say that to you. And we can show this is the case by simply watching a time lapse of crepuscular rays showing that they don't always triangulate to the same position. So unless the sun is doing crazy up and down left and right movements all of the time, Capuscular rays cannot triangulate back to the sun because the apparent position of triangulation changes both over time and with position compared to the capuscular rays. Um, but to answer your question of how do we know the sun's 93 million miles away? Well, that's simple. We've measured the distance to the sun um, with radar. Do me, a favor, um, do me a favor, right? Can you show me that demonstration you did about how the pilots was able to look down at the sun? Because what happened, right? I never got to deal with that. In that demonstration, you said that it was the sun rays that were appearing to be under the clouds, you had the sun rays coming Absolutely, from yeah. the sun. Uh, this is not a sun ray. This is actually the sun itself right here that we're observing. That's that you you, you just no. You just we know. don't observe the sun. We observe the light coming from the uh, sun. Okay, oh, uh, you're not. That's how looking seeing at works. My, uh, you can't see my screen share. Let me let me show you my screen. You're, share. you're just showing Google. You were just showing a Google page there. Sorry. Okay, my bad. There, that's the one I'm talking about. Yeah. So yeah. that's not a yeah, sun so ray. That's the, my my on, my on, paint wait, 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 wait. I got a question. Is that the actual sun right there under that cloud? No, it's the light coming from the sun. So this ball, this yellow ball that I see, it, it, that's cloaked in these clouds, that's not the sun. That's the light coming from the sun. Well, no, yes, that's, we see, we don't see things. We see the light coming from things. That's how seeing works. Okay, so this is just bananas what you're saying because... What we're looking at right there. Do you disagree? That's how you oh, see oh, things. Wait, 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 wait. No, you, you're moving the goalposts. Listen up. The sun is in a direct area that we see it on this video because the clouds surrounding it ain't lit up. If we go back over here, those clouds that's, that's, that's not near the sun, they're more darker because it's lighting up the thing locally. It's literally the source of the light is right here cloaked in the clouds. That is not the light of the sun. That is the sun that we see in this image. I don't understand how you can say that, that this yellow ball we looking at right You, you there, see the light. You don't see things. So you still, I mean, that's just you know, with, with, with all due respect, bro. That's just how seeing works. You see the light that comes from well, things. I, I you don't that. see I, things. So 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 what what you want? So wait, wait, let, wait, wait, let me finish. Wait, 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 wait. It's my ten minutes. You're making two different arguments. No, it's I'm our. It's our. I'm not, I'm not so, talking okay. about how I see. I'm talking about what I'm seeing right here. It's the source of the light that you're speaking of, and I shouldn't be seeing the source. No, you're of seeing light the light coming from it. Not, that's the source of the light. That's not the light coming from it. That's yeah, you're, you're still looking at the. You're still looking at the sun and seeing the light coming from the sun, exactly as my diagram earlier showed. So this is not um, the sun. But, this, but, one more time but, for the record, this is not the sun. It's the light coming from the sun okay, because that's how you. seeing works. We got yeah. You. So uh, and and you know you you kind of avoided my 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 question, which was how are we able to measure it with radar? Sorry. What what is that? That's my bad. It's the wrong clock. 
sounded sorry. Like. <laughs> um, all right. So we got another 10 minutes going to reset that. And now Craig, you get to kind of take us in whatever direction you want. You can continue on this line of talk or you can completely go. Yeah. So well, I, yeah, I just want to finish that bit quickly and then I've got another thing to talk about. So um, yeah. Um, so you can say, you know, seeing things like this all you want, but, but the, the simple answer to it is that we can use um, a known working technology called radar call to eyes, measure the distance to the eyes, sun. Call our eyes, call our uh, eyes. Wh why, why are you talking over me like it's, that? It's, it's the back and forth round, but go ahead. Well, I hadn't, I was in the middle of talking and then you just started saying random things. So uh, again, we can use known technology um, called radar to actually measure the distance to the sun we, we don't need to rely on our eyes we can use known wow. working technology uh, and it, it's it's been done that has been measured with radar um i could present a paper from the, the 1960s where they actually used you know ground-based radar to measure the distance to the sun and get a ping back and it was 93 million miles so my, my my question to you is how are we able to use radar to measure the distance to the sun is 93 million miles if the distance to the sun is not 93 million miles. Okay, so he said in the in the 60s, right? They measured using radar the distance uh 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 not of 93 million miles. The longest radar that we had during the 60s was between 30 and 50 miles. That this was what was on Warcraft aircraft. People, if you think that we have... Could radar, you provide a citation wait, wait, for that, please? Wait a minute. Wait a minute. We, finna go, we can go to the history of radar here. All we got to look up is the longest radar uh, de detection uh, transmission in the, uh, what, the 60s is what you said, I think? Yeah, the 60s. That's all we got yeah. to do. And guess what? Show me anywhere in the 60s where they made a radar detection of 93 million miles with the technology they they uh had in the 60s show me where okay well doing, i'm hold on yeah. show, show me where they doing that the day too for that matter they not even doing that today. well i'm presenting the paper right now that they no, use the I'm, technology yeah you, yeah you, again this this this, say, this, this, this is the paper uh, 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 you know uh, no it's not he says she say it is a scientific paper documented um you know of of a scientific experiment if you want to ignore scientific documentation then then that's that's your prerogative but it kind of means that you're just going to ignore science this is something that can be repeated um if, if you want to go ahead and do that but it is a documented scientific experiment that in um 1961 um they measured it using radar um and they've got all the calculations and the type of, of radar and everything here and measured the distance to the sun of 93 million okay, miles. Can I ask you, ju you just, wait I, one I, sec, you just saying, you just saying radar couldn't go that far it is just the claim when I have a scientific paper talking about the okay, technology that they question. used for radar to go that okay, far. Okay, fair enough, I got a question. Can you tell me the name and type of radar they use and its specifications so we can actually see was it able to detect something for 93 million miles? We want to see the numbers. I want to see uh, so I can look up its capabilities and other radars at that time, their capabilities as well. And we want to know, was there anyone in the 60s building radar that could detect out that far, right? Because I Yeah, the people that did this experiment, yeah. Cool. Can you show me? Can we get into the specifications at all? Yeah. Uh, so briefly, one radar experiment was performed by transmitting a coded signal to the sun for 16 minutes. The round trip time and then receiving the echo for the following 16 minutes. The average transmitted power is 500 kilowatts and the antenna gain is 33 to 36 decibels relative to isotropic. There is the particular specifications. Um, my question to you is, what is your knowledge and qualifications in radar technology to be able to analyze that data? Oh, so you 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 don't have any qualifications yourself. I mean, the purpose. No, I do. I actually on, do. I you, I've you, worked you, with radar you, in the military. You ask, you, ask, you ask the question. I work with radar in the military as well. So check this out. Let me answer your question. Right. What I do know about me using radar is that it has limitations, and that the best radar can can detect out the furthest. You, you get a longer detection bubble, with, with, and that's going to cost you more money, though. Detection now, bubble. That's not how this, radar this, works. Okay, what I'm telling you, you know exactly what I'm talking about. We're not going to play a semantic game. You don't want to okay. have the... See, this is what's going on. You don't want to really have the conversation of 
the technology uh, that uh, right, please, using in the no I, I just talk, I just gave you the technology with the, spe the specifics of the technology and you're telling me I didn't give you that 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 specific uh, why are you doing that why are you literally lying about the thing that okay, I just so did that's not saying. very honest okay what you gave me doesn't prove that th that radar was capable of detecting something 93 million miles away that's the, the the exact power and everything that, that we needed to do it. Yeah, there's no reason why that those specifications would not be able I, to do I it. Gotta, That's gotta, powerful enough to be able to do it. I, I radar, it, radar, it, radar is an electromagnetic signal that is a self-propagating wave. There's nothing to stop it in space. Um, you know, they were able to detect the signal back. You know, the, I gave you the specifics of the technology. You can do the maths around those specifics and show that it would be capable of doing that if you like. Okay, that's something you globally should have been did. But nevertheless, though, I'll say this. I've done that. If you if anybody can do this that's watching the debate, you can research on your own the capabilities of radar technology in the 60s. And I'm going to tell you, if what he's given us is true, then guess what, y'all? That was the best radar uh, even up to today because we got radars we're making in 2022, 2023 that can't detect something 93 million miles away. And the reason that these radars can detect the sun because it's not 93 million miles away. Well, except the measurements from the radar shows that it is, of course. I, I mean, all you're doing is going, you don't think that technology exists when I just presented you a paper with the specific, you know what, spec you, you specificity know what, of the technology. And, hey. you know, you can't just say, I don't, you know, it doesn't exist when it's there. They did it and they measured the distance to the sun and they measured it at 93 million miles. So okay. that's a physical so, empirical measurement. Okay, so this is, this is his, guess what, guys? He's giving me a bunch of measurements saying, this is what you would need, boom, 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 but... That's no proof of none of this. Just because he got... I just presented it. Nope. Just because he's... That, that, that's not proof, guys. That's not proof at all. The mathematical you proof is included so, there. So you're not going to let me re respond? So this is what I'm saying. Well, nothing... Again, this is what he's straying away from. Nothing that he showed, guys, can prove that the capabilities of radar tech technology in the 60s can detect something 93 million miles away. What he proved is that you can detect something with radar and have your radar show up any number it won't, if anything. But that's why he need to do his own experiments firsthand. Today, if you look at what happened in this debate, I've been showing up using the scientific method first-hand observations and no, research he's been showing up using technology specifications he said we shouldn't use our eyes we should use radar right no you should use your eyes that's uh -huh. what the debate is that's what the our eyes can't I, measure I, I showed him a picture when, uh, of the sun and he said this that wasn't the sun that's the light from the sun now he want to talk to us to death about yeah. radar specifications in the 60s and they can barely send a radio uh signal uh, you know, across the world in the in the sixties, they were just now getting into radio technology almost, and and now he's talking about they they was able to detect something with radar that was ninety three million miles away in the sixties, guys. Just think about that for yourself. We okay, don't well, have um, radar what you just said was do incorrect. That. We do not have uh, okay, right, radar. Bro, could today. I talk now? Thank you. Show me radar right, today. Bro, could, could, could I talk now? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, Show could, me radar. Could I, could I talk now? Thank you. Yeah. So um, first off, you're wrong. They actually transmitted a radio signal across the you know, Atlantic Ocean in like 1900. Um, so, you know, maybe you should research your, your and increase your knowledge about that particular thing. Um, but again, I have literally presented the, the evidence, the scientific experiment, the paper that documented the scientific experiment. There is nothing that says that radio uh, radar cannot do that. You're just saying that it can't. Well, that's a lovely claim on your part that you would need to take the data from the experiment and show with maths and known physics and science why the radar couldn't do that instead of just saying it. So, um, you know, all, all you've done is made a bunch of claims and you haven't used the scientific method because you've not actually presented experiments or, or a hypothesis or a prediction when I specifically did those things. In fact, I'm the only one that has used what could be considered the scientific method in this debate. <laughs> really? But again, yes, 100%. What, what I got here is that in World War II, 
the the longest that radar could pick up enemy aircraft was at 80 miles. If we had well, was, not, was World on, wait, War II before wait, wait, 1960 if, or if, if, if we had if we had tech, I'm just saying though we did I'm be dealing with the 1900s is what I'm dealing with. I'm dealing with the 1900s. Uh -huh. I'm showing you radar technology. Even in the 2000s, our radar technology ain't going 93 million miles. It's going. Can you provide evidence of that claim? You should. This is your argument. You should be doing. Well, this. I, I've provided evidence. I provided evidence of my claim by presenting because scientific listen, experiment. I, I made um, my claim. And then, and, well, hold on. No, 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 let me no, let me let me finish, please. No, no, hold on. You asked please. a question. You asked I haven't question. finished. I haven't finished you talking. No, I didn't ask. Question. I haven't finished I'm talking. Hold on. I'm gonna give you each one minute. I'm gonna give you each one minute uninterrupted. Yeah, yeah. Then we're moving on. So one minute, Craig. Go ahead and go first. You have a minute. Yeah, um, bro, what you did there was kind of ridiculous. You tried to debunk technology in the 1960s by showing technology from the Second World War, which, as we're all aware, was before the 1960s, that had a range of about 80 miles. Well, that's specifically military radar, which would have not been as powerful as the radar specifically designed for the experiment in the 1960s. Um, I have presented the specifications of the radar. I have presented the experiment and the paper showing the experiment. So I have met my burden. All you're doing is going, I don't think radar can do that. Well, that is something that you would have to provide evidence for. Do you have evidence that radar is incapable of traveling 93 million miles and giving us a ping? Or is just that just your opinion about radar? Um, okay. Over to you. Now, you got a minute. My minute now, Jerry. Your uh, mic's low. So thank you for my minute. Um, he doesn't have proof that radar can detect something 93 million miles other than reading specs. And those specs, we don't know just because uh, the, the specs he read. How do you know because of that now the radar can detect 93 million miles? So I don't have. So, so check, check this out, guys. We're having a conversation and he talking while it's my time running. I didn't do that to him, but check it out, right? He's, we're having a conversation about radar capabilities now when we were starting off talking about how far away is the sun. Now, he don't own a radar right now. I don't own a radar that can really go out and do this, but we do got a set of eyes. My argument was made off me using my eyes and observation, and that wasn't enough for him. He wanted radar, but he don't own radar, mm -hmm. so he got to regurgitate stuff offline, and that's not fair because now we have an argument about radar capabilities versus what our eyes see right now. And we're not debating about the truth. We, 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 it was dancing. He got us off track. Okay, we're moving <laughs> on. The next uh, section is just called holes. It's just Brilliant. one of the it's bro Sanchez going first. You have two minutes and then Craig, you have three minutes to respond. This is supposed to be where you just, uh, you know, lay out the holes you find in his argument, uh, but can really be about anything. So you got two minutes to kind of say your problem because this is the last thing before the closing. Well, okay. Thank you. Good. good. I'm, uh, this, uh, this is what I'm going to say about Craig's performance today. He has done a lot of showing data, but not showing observations, which that's the first step of the scientific method. He's shown his arguments lie in t the technological capabilities of NASA and modern science. My arguments lie in me using critical thinking and observing phenomena in the natural world, which is what science was supposed to be about. And that's why when I say, let me use my eyes, he say, no, let's talk about radar technology. When I say, when I make certain observations that's undeniable, we end up debating about the capabilities of technology or, 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 or agencies like NASA when that's not really the shape of the earth or how far away the sun is. I think he did a lot of smoke screening. I think he did a lot of just wasting time with pointless data that he didn't even process himself. And he's telling his opponent to do it for him, which is kind of lazier in a way. I also think that, um, you know, he, he talk about a lot of failed experiments like Foucault's pendulum, the cavit pendulum, you know, uh, the Cavendish experiment. He talk about these things, but he don't actually re repeat them and recreate them. He say that these experiments are so repeatable. They've been repeated over and over again, but he should show us a video of him himself repeating them, guys. Right. I asked him to give me another year on. I think it was the. Uh. Cavendish experiment another year when that was done 
No, that was the one with the triangulation to measure the earth. He gave me one year they did it. He said they done this many times. And then whenever they say that, they're lying. I asked him to prove it. I called his bluff. And he never did give me other uh, re repeatings of this experiment. Okay. You got three minutes to respond, Craig. Uh, yeah. Um, I, I mean, I, I don't, a lot, a lot of that was just kind of uh, attacking me for no reason. Um, yeah, everything that I presented starts with observations. They make observations and then do experiments based on those observations. I was just actually showing, you know, the um, the outcome of the scientific method instead of just an observation. Um, you, you can't use your eyes as a measurement tool. Your eyes are not a measurement tool. Your eyes do not have the ability to detect distance or to tell you how fast something is going or to tell you that something is tilting at a certain degree. Your eyes are not capable of precisely measuring things. So of course we have to use tools to actually confirm observations. You know, you, you seem to be stuck on the first part of the scientific method of observation without actually then, you know, doing the rest of it. Whereas I, I do the whole thing. Um, uh, to answer your question about the Cavendish experiment and the Foucault's pendulum, yes, I have done them myself personally in my physics degree in 2002. No, I don't have a video of that because you don't tend to record on video everything you do at university. Science does not require everybody to provide evidence of themselves doing an experiment. That's that's nothing to do with science. I can present you the Cavendish and the Foucault's pendulum experiment being done by lots of people, including people personally that I know that have done it and recorded it in recent times. I don't need to do it because I've already done it. I've already confirmed it to myself. It doesn't matter that I didn't record it because there's other people that have recorded it and shown this evidence to be factual. Um, you know, empirical data is a very important part of science because without empirical data you can't actually find anything out um you are complaining that i was presenting data when that is very important because the data um is where proof in science lies because as we all know and jaronism will agree science does not prove things proof lies in the mathematics um so you, you just asked me to prove that I've done the, that's not that's not how it works. I can present you the outcome of the experiments, the data that has analyzed the experiments that have come from a prediction, which came from a hypothesis, which came from an observation. I did the entire scientific method where you're stuck at the beginning. Um, the Cavendish experiment, you can do yourself if you want to. It's not even that expensive or difficult to do. The pendulum, Foucault's pendulum experiment, you can do it yourself if you want to. It's not that difficult or expensive. I've done it myself. I have confirmed that these things work. Um, and just because I don't have a video of it doesn't matter. I don't need to present you a video of it. I can present you other people doing it that matches the things that I found out when I did my experiment itself. The only way, Bro Sanchez, that you could possibly ever debunk the Cavendish experiment or the Foucault's pendulum experiment is by doing the experiments yourself and doing them properly. Hey, Craig, you got, uh, start us off. You got two minutes and then Bro's got three minutes to respond about his holes in his argument good okay so the yeah, holes in your argument um you you have no understanding of what relative motion and relative speed is um you, your whole argument about tools should come flying off that this, when a, a, an astronaut uses them in space is just a, a fundamental misunderstanding of newton's laws of motion which is what our entire world is based on you drive a car yes i'm sure you drive a car that car is designed using newton's laws of motion the same laws of motion that determine that that camera should not randomly fly out of that astronaut's hand um your, your argument about comets was just ignorance of what a comet actually is and what the tail is um i hope now that i've cleared that up for you and you understand that the tail is sublimation of um solid to gases being pushed away from the comet um by solar radiation by charged particles from the sun in fact what you actually find is that comets tend to have two tails one which is in the direction of its movement towards the sun and one which is in the direction of the solar particles being pushed away both a direction of uh both a result of the charged particles hitting it and moving in different directions um your argument about we don't see the blur the earth blurred it's simply a misunderstanding of how cameras and lights and everything works like i said 
if you're standing next to a plane and that plane's going 500 miles an hour, it's going to be a blur. But you can look at a plane in the distance that's going 500 miles an hour and it looks like it's barely moving to you. Um, uh, so I, I hope that cleared that up. Your, your argument about water just clumping up in space is, you know, that's hydrodynamic equilibrium. When there's no forces acting on water, it just becomes a sphere. However, you put that water into an enclosed pressurized system and have a pump on it, there is now forces acting on that water or the liquid, and it's not just going to be a glob. So um, uh, I, I've explained corpuscular rays and debunked the notion of a small local sun by referring to the experiment done in the 1960s using radar, a known technology that works to actually measure the distance to the sun. Um, time. And uh, Bro Sanchez, you got three minutes. Close us out here. Go ahead. Okay, so guys, in my closing, I just want to say something to what he just said. He Bro, your mic is cracking. Sorry, yeah, I, it's like okay. Uh, is, this, is this? Yeah, better? that's better. Sorry, is that better? better. So, that's better. Yeah. Okay, hold on. He made an argument using a car, you know, to talk about why things don't fly out of your hand and stuff. But the car is a contained environment. We, if I put you on a surface, if, if I put you on a surface of the car, those things will fly out of your hand. So they do this all the time. They make an argument using something that's irrelevant to the model that they're trying to prove. The next thing is he used the airplane in a distance to explain why we don't see the rotational blur of the earth. I used a spinning top. I didn't use a toy truck. He must don't understand the experiment, right? Because the airplane isn't rotating. It's going in a forward motion. If the airplane was rotating at a thousand miles per hour and going in a forward motion, I would see a blur in the sky, a moving blur. Cause just like you see a blur from my hand, uh, so so my thing is if I was filming that airplane with a camera and it was spinning around at a thousand miles per hour, yes, you would get this motion blur. And and and, it ha and he's bringing up the forward motion of the airplane while not even dressing the very argument of the matter, which is the rotation. The airplane is not rotating. He's done that a lot tonight, and we shouldn't let him get away with it, guys. I've hands down won this debate because he's <laughs> – because stuff like that, right? No decorum, right? Interrupting when it's not time to interrupt, stuff like that. But at the I same time – Okay, okay, he's still talking during my time. We'll forgive him. That's what happened when you know you lost. So my thing is he he's talking about, he again, he made examples that wasn't even addressing the arguments that I made because him using a car, we don't live on a inside of a car according to his globe earth. We live on top of it if he want to use the car. That was a bad example. And when he talked again, the, the airplane moving forward in the distance, he didn't address the rotation. He's not addressing my arguments because he can't, guys. And I want y'all to remember that in my closing. Okay, we are on to the closing statements. You got uh, eight minutes each. And go ahead and mute when the other guy's on so that we don't hear any sounds. Uh, My apologies. <laughs> just mute for this next eight minutes. Bro Sanchez, yeah. you're up first. You got eight minutes. Whenever you start, I'll start the clock. Okay. So I thought that was the closing. What I can do with eight minutes, guys, is a lot. So I'm mm -hmm. going to actually go ahead and kind of screen share and get in some more. Uh, uh, kind of like, you know, reinforce my arguments one more time then. So you could go ahead and start my eight minutes, Jerry. I want you guys, uh, I really want to uh, keep this image up, guys. If you ask me throughout this whole debate, I think this was Craig's most terrifying moment right here. This is a footage that Craig never want to really deal with. He gave us a little scribble scrabble of a globe earth, and he did, and, and guess what I wish he would do for me? Can you sh show that one time if it's still accessible? Can you sh screen share your diagram for me? I, so I, I, I deleted it. Sorry. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it, it was just this quick scribble I did on paint. Sorry, I didn't save it. <laughs> okay. Well, look, guys, I wish I could get on paint and share it, but I'm just going to make my point. What he was showing was basically based on his demonstration, 
we don't really see. We can't really look down at the sun. We think we looking down at the actual sun, but we looking down at the light of the sun. That's why when I pointed directly at this little yellow ball right here and I said, Craig, is that the sun? He said, no, it's the light of the sun. But he's what, what's going on, he's not admitting that the sun is the source of light. This, when you say we're looking at the light of the sun, I'm like, yeah, we're looking at the sun itself, right? The source of the light you're speaking of. And um, we can actually see that because what I wanted to do was, was point out as they was traveling toward the sun, the clouds that was around them, it wasn't as lit up because the sun is casting its, its uh, it, it, it has a certain level of luminosity, right? And it's a local object. And as they get close to the sun, it's getting brighter and brighter, of course, just like local lighting, how it will work. And as we can see here, they finally get close to the sun. And man, w there's no doubt about it that that is the, the sun itself and not a sun, sun ray or sun rays. He's telling us we're literally looking at sun rays right now, plural. And I'm like, no, we're looking at the sun right now. That was one crucial point of the debate that I would like to dedicate a lot of my closing time to kind of exploit that a little bit because he really ran from that. I also have a video here that I didn't get to show during the, um, the, the debate earlier. So for my closing time, I wanted to just show this clip of a pilot chasing the sun. The fact that we can chase the sun proves that it's local. It's taking the sunlight to you and it's creating time as it come to us. And it's a local object, right? That's right here in our sky. When I was uh, stationed in Osun Air Base, Korea, um, I experienced my birthday, November 22nd in Osun. I got in a plane after my birthday ceremony on base or whatever. And they were telling me that, hey, when you get to America, it's going to be November 22nd all over again. When I left the base, it was daytime. But as, as I flew to America, I never experienced night. And I never thought nothing of it then, but I actually was chasing the sun. My whole flight back to America was in daylight all the way to the point when I got to America. It was just November 22nd afternoon i had a, two birthdays basically i could have kept chasing the sun having another birthday another birthday to it made a complete circuit now and it's 23 20, 23rd you know how, so we're, that's what i'm saying the sun literally uh, appears like a local object we experience it like a local object and um that's why i believe in the debate craig wanted to resort to having a radar uh, conversation about the technology of radar and a bunch of data that will take us away from using our senses and observational based uh, methodology, which is if he, he talked about the scientific method and the first step is observation, you know what I'm saying? Not to gather data, but to make the observation. He's not making the observation. He's gathering the data and, and, and he's just really skipping the whole methodology. He brought up comets throughout this debate. We talked about the tail on a comet. Now, he's saying that this is sublimation and the, the radiation from the sun or whatever, when there shouldn't even be any combustion in a vacuum. We, can, we know that fire needs to be fueled by oxygen. If there's no oxygen in space, then... There shouldn't even be any combustion going on. We didn't even get on that one. But nevertheless, if the sublimation is the argument for why the uh, comet is losing its atmosphere and its compositional makeup, then why can't we make that argument for why the um, astronaut on the ISS should lose his equipment? See, it can work for them both. It can't be picky. That argument don't change the fact that once you tell me whatever the reason is, then that reason is true for the astronaut too. So that was one thing I wanted to bring home. You know, they're on something going 18,000 miles per hour and they got little bolts in their hand, little screws, you know, that's just something to think about.
He said, I don't understand how cameras work. I use them every day, guys. And one thing is for sure, there is no kind of uh, situation to where we're filming an earth that's rotating a thousand miles per hour to where we will not see motion blur. He's saying because the earth is so big, it, it just eludes you every time. Their answer every time is the mass, the size of the earth, relativity. And I told you he would do that at the beginning of the debate, guys. I told you that Craig would do that, and he did it. This picture did not come from me, by the way. This came from the BBC when they did a documentary on uh, the earth spinning. And... Apparently, I'm not the only one that kind of think that this is assumed this is what we should see. Like I said, he can't deny this because even in the live footage that they show when they're hovering above the earth and all of that, we do not see the earth. Thank you. We do not see the earth rotating, guys, at a thousand miles per hour. Remember, guys, all of his arguments have been your eyes can deceive you. We can't rely on our eyes. He said the eyes are not capable of detecting distance. So you telling me, I don't know. You don't need to be driving, Craig, if you really believe that. Your eyes are capable of detecting distance, man. And if they're not capable of detecting things, speed, and motion, then what's the purpose of our eyes? Of course I can know when I look down a street, uh, different relative speeds of, of the cars that are going down a street and how far away they are. We take eye exam tests and all that to prove uh, the show distances and all this. Like when you you just don't want to rely on your eyes because if you got to do that, you'll lose. And you can play around with technology and trickery and and pointless data that's neither here nor there. Thank you very much for that, Craig. You got eight minutes to close us out. Thank you. Um, Bruce Sanchez has spent the entire debate straw manning um, the globe model and the claims that, that are made. Um, for instance, the things that he just said there, um, he talked about sublimation and compared it to combustion. Sublimation is not combustion. Sublimation is simply a solid becoming a gas, skipping the liquid phase, which is what we would expect to happen to ice in a vacuum. There's no combustion, no fire involved. So I'm not not entirely sure where, where, where you got that from. And again, a comet is not a person. A comet is losing its mass because of solar radiation, pushing those um, you know, uh, sublimated gases away from, from the comet. A, a, a human, a, a national outside the ISS does not have sublimated gases that will be pushed away. Um, and, you know, when I was talking about a car, um, my point was a car is designed using Newton's laws of motion. Those laws of motion that work because cars work are the same laws of motion that says that there's no reason why the tool should come out of the astronaut's hand. Um you 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 really don't understand cameras because as i explained a, a extremely fast shutter will even if something is moving very fast freeze the image and allow you to get you know a non blurred shot of something that is moving very fast when looking at the earth from outer space you are a very long way away from it um the only bit of the earth that is moving a thousand miles an hour is is the equator obviously the rest of it isn't um and when you are looking at that a thousand miles an hour um and looking at the earth from outer space that thousand miles an hour will be a part of the earth moving one twenty-fourth of the earth's radius over an hour you if you were right next to something moving a thousand miles an hour like the linear surface of the earth is but so the earth is rotating at 0 0.00694 rpm but the surface is moving in a linear fashion at a thousand miles an hour so if you're looking at, if you were right next to the surface of the earth and able to be detached from it somehow, and, and it moved past at a thousand miles an hour, it'd be a blur. But then if you moved that, if you uh, observed that ground moving at a thousand miles an hour from, you know, 20,000 miles away, it's not going to have motion blur because you're not right up next to it. it it's it's just how, how it works. Um, so, you know, 
I, I don't understand any of your arguments about that because none of them are the arguments that we make. Um, and when we talk about the scientific method, you know, I do use the scientific method. But what I've done is I've shown the complete scientific method with your picture of the the the, the sun apparently underneath the clouds. What you're doing is you're going here's an observation, and that's where you're stopping. You're not then going, well, let's get a hypothesis and make a prediction and maybe perform an experiment, which is what I've shown. OK, so we see the sun, which apparently appears to be local. That's an observation. Right. So a hypothesis from that would be that the sun is 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 small and local. So then we would make a prediction that um, if we were to measure the distance to the sun with radar, we would be able to measure that the sun is small and local. This is following this, the scientific method. We've got an observation. We've done the hypothesis. We've got the prediction. The next part would be to perform an experiment. So we we design a, a radar system capable of measuring the distance to the sun, and we measure the distance to the sun. And what they find when they do that is that it disproves the hypothesis of the sun being small and local, definitely not less than 30,000 know, feet above the ground. What we do when we follow the scientific method all the way through and we analyze the data, which is the fifth step in the basic version of the scientific method, we find that the data from the experiments that we got when we followed the scientific method disproves the hypothesis of the sun being small and local. Your problem is you stop at observation and don't do the rest, whereas I do the entire scientific method, which is the difference between us. Our eyes, yes, they can detect speed and distance, but you can't measure them. There is no way with your eyes you could measure a particular speed. That's just not how it works. You could guess, but your eyes are not capable of measuring things. I never said they couldn't detect things. I just said your eyes are not capable of making measurements, and they're not. You cannot look at something and go, that is definitely X distance away. You can make an estimation, but the only way to confirm that is to actually measure it with some method. Our eyes are not measuring tools. Our eyes are used for observations, which we then need to find other ways to actually, you know, try and figure out what that means. Um, you fail the scientific method because you stop at observation. You don't do the rest. I can present experiment after experiment that follows the scientific method and disproves the notion of a small and local sun. I can use the scientific method to measure the rotation of the Earth and disprove the notion that the Earth is stationary using the scientific method that, that you just like to stop at observation of. I can use the scientific method to figure out that there's a apparent accelerating force that we call gravity um, and measure it and confirm that it's there by following the scientific method, observation, hypothesis, prediction, experiment, analyze. That is the basic version of the scientific method that you learn in high school. It's not the entire scientific method, which is something that you would also need to learn. Every different branch of science and industry around science has their own version of the scientific method, but that is the basic version we learn in high school, and you don't follow it. You stop at observation. I can present measurements of the Earth's radius showing that the Earth is curved. We And that can even be part of the scientific method. I make an observation that there's a horizon. So I make a hypothesis that the horizon is there because the Earth is curved. Um, so then a prediction is that we would be able to measure the radius of the Earth as the Earth is curved. And then you have the transcontinental triangulation of the American arc of the parallel, which could count as the experiment part of that which fails to disprove the hypothesis. Um, and then we analyze the data, which is the final part, which I presented. You know, I didn't have to go through it all. That's just the final part, but the rest of it has been done. And when we analyze the data, we find that it shows the Earth is curved. Follow the scientific method all the way through. And every single time, if you do it properly, you'll find out that it confirms the Earth is not flat and stationary. It fails uh, in fact, it, you know, it does very well at disproving the notion of a flat and stationary Earth. And that's what we can use the scientific method for. And when we do it, and we do it properly, we find that the Earth can't be flat and stationary because nothing holds up to experimentation. And to finish off by quoting Richard Feynman, if it doesn't agree 
with experimentation, then it is wrong. And I'm done. Well, thank you guys. That was pretty good. No, uh, no major problems. So, uh, appreciate you guys. I could, I could start shouting for a bit if you like, if you'd prefer, yeah. I can, you know, wait till I leave. <laughs> <laughs> no. Um, so make sure there's no crazy music on. All right. Yeah. Bruce, yeah. I don't know if you want to say anything else. Go ahead. Yeah. I just want to say that, um, good debate. Thank you everybody for coming out. There will be many more continuations of this. Uh, I know Craig agreed to more than one, just one. Uh, uh-huh. debate, yeah. so, so we'll be doing more. Um, good sportsmanship, good energy from both sides. All in all, man, you know, thank you. Every, everybody wins, you know, here today. Um, we will be going live, Craig, having an after party. You're invited where we'll get the people on. And only the people that purchase tickets will be able to come up and say who they think won and why. If you didn't, you know, purchase tickets, you won't be able to participate in that. So, Craig, I do want you to, uh, you know, if you have time later or whatever. Yeah, no, uh, um, what uh, what time were you thinking? Actually, as soon as we end here, an hour. Yeah, yeah, I can I can do that. Okay. Um, yeah, if you give me like 15 minutes to use oh, yeah. the, the loo and grab a drink and stuff, I join, oh, no worries. Oh, yeah. So, thank, appreciate it. Yeah. That. yeah. Hey, and bro, whilst we got a chance, I know um, I know you were a military and I've never said to you specifically, um, I know you're American and I'm, and I'm British, but still, I appreciate people that serve in the military. So thank you for your service. Thank you, man. Air Force, who you are. Yep. Uh, Ro- Royal Navy myself, so. Yeah, appreciate that, Craig. So I'm going to go ahead um, and shut this yeah. down then. Be- before then- we go, I think um, we should both acknowledge that Jaronism did a fantastic job as a moderator. Um uh, you know, everyone here knows that I disagree with both Jaronism and Brother Sanchez about the shape of the earth and, and things like that. However, um, I think Jaronism is extremely good at controlling a debate and staying you know, biased and, and neutral. And I very much appreciate you taking the time, Jaronism. Thank you. Well, thanks. You guys have been great and make it very easy. You are the best for the job, Jaron. And uh, the I, I agree. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we All the moderators to... I've had, I think you're the best. <laughs> yeah, we, we're going to yeah. keep him a uh, permanent moderator for this thing, man. And then also uh, the format. I have no uh, complaints about his format either. You know, yeah, I like that. I, I liked it myself. So you guys think, I mean, the hardest thing about the format that's weird is the where the rebuttals come in. Because, you know, when the first person goes first and then the second person does his intro, then the that person reboots the second person. So it's like then the the guy who reboots the first one is the farthest away. I don't know how you fix that. I yeah. I always an issue in debates. That is yeah. Right. I mean, that's why making notes is important, I think, um, so that we can come back to it. <laughs> Do you that's think it's the, better to do like the first person then the rebuttal than the second person then the rebuttal? I've never really seen may, that done. M- maybe I did try it, but it's um, when I did it, it got a bit confusing because they kind of wanted to answer questions out of sync. Yeah. I, I still think the way that you did it is probably overall the best way. Okay, yeah, cool, yeah. good enough. Me too. So, and we appreciate you once again. And we're closing out. Thank you, everybody, for coming out. Peace and love, guys.